The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Major support for Compass is provided by the ongoing support of the Leo P. Flynn Estate of Millbank, South Dakota. Additional support is provided by the Southwest Minnesota Private Industry Council, promoting Southwest Minnesota as a place rich with opportunity. Come for the jobs, stay for the lifestyle. More information at swmnpic.org. Welcome to Compass, a production of Pioneer Public Television. I'm Les Heen, your host for Compass, and this is a weekly discussion of public policy and important issues facing our viewing area. This week, we will talk about how agriculture has found a place in schools and classrooms across the state. We'll have representatives from the Minnesota Ag in the Classroom Program and the state's FFA Foundation. And we'll touch on how agriculture is being used and taught in our region. First, Pioneer's Laura K. Prosser takes us to Granite Falls, where every year students come there to experience the Ag in the Classroom program firsthand. Here's Laura's report. The classroom isn't just for math, science, and English anymore. Many schools have made room for agriculture. Roger Dale and Carl Luwaji know firsthand the importance of having Ag in the classroom, and they're here to tell us a little bit about the annual demonstrations held in Granite Falls. So Roger, why don't you tell us a little bit about this event and how it got started? Well, a number of years ago, the elevator at Hanley Falls had their annual meeting and the supper was at the church. And one of the school teachers from just playing Cottonwood at that time asked my wife and I if we'd bring over a soybean display that we had set up at the, uh, at the elevator annual meeting. And uh, sure, we'd do that. The next year she says, would you bring it back? And would you talk to the uh, kids about soybeans? So we did. And that's how this got started. And then a couple of years later, then Dougie Alvin come on board with the corn. And so we, go, we used to go to all the schools in the area. And it's been growing ever since. So why is it so important, gentlemen, either of you can answer this, to have such an educational event for school kids? Probably for me, the biggest thing is I think a lot of these kids live in small towns and rural areas, and they are not necessarily know what's right out their back door. Well, agriculture is two and three generations removed from the from the families. Years ago, the the town kids even in the summer they'd go out and work in the farm. You don't see that anymore. The local kids don't even know. A lot of them don't know where their food comes from. It comes from the rural area, from the farm. And uh, the farmers get a bad rap a lot of times on environmental issues. That's why the SCS office is here and they talk about environmental with, uh, with, the, with the soil and water. Because we drink the same water the kids do. And um, we as farmers, we want to pass the farm on to the next generation as good as we had it, as, as we got it, if not better. So Carl, tell me a little bit about what's involved in this event. For as far as getting, just getting the groups together, and a lot of these commodity groups are more than willing to come in and give a 20-minute presentation to kids just to exposure, you know, exposure for their organization and also for the kids to realize what's there. That's true. Now, how many schools are involved in this? There's 11 schools. 11 schools. This year. And we have about 350 students this yeah. year. Plus homeschoolers. So what topics are covered? Well, we started with, with soybeans and then corn come on board. Well, now we've got nine different uh, stations we have. We've got farm safety and uh, turkeys, dairy, beef, REC, pigs. Obviously soybeans and corn. Soybeans and corn. And also uh, NRCS office, you know, out of Clarkfield talking. I think they're talking this year on uh, aquatic invasions. The kids get a very well-rounded education, wouldn't you say? And the majority of the people putting on these demonstrations 
are farmers. So they're speaking from the heart. Well, and that's how this whole thing started, was it was a bunch of farmers wanting to educate their children. True. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. That's it for us in Granite Falls. I'm Pioneer's Laura K. Prosser. Back to Les in the studio. And with us now to talk about what's new in the Ag in the Classrooms in Minnesota, we have Sue Knott, and Sue is with the Minnesota Ag in the Classroom program. And we have from the FFA Foundation, its Executive Director, Val Arsbald. Sue, Val, thanks for joining us on Compass. Thank you. Um, it's one of my favorite topics. I love Ag in the Classroom because I, uh, as, as so many people in our viewing area are, grew up in a farm, spent a lot of time with agriculture. But, Sue, in your case, Ag in the Classroom, it, it's a statewide program. And even though the story showed how it worked in a, in a broader set, I mean, it's really about empowering teachers. That's Most of the time. Yeah, that's exactly right. We really try to provide resources and tools to teachers throughout the state that teach a wide variety of topics. So you could be a first grade teacher, or fifth grade, middle school science, high school math, whatever. And um, we try to provide lesson plans, print materials, videos, just resources so agriculture can be one of the tools to help students achieve, um, you know, the required concepts and standards in those areas. So it's really about not agriculture as a separate topic as much for teachers to so say, here's how you can use agriculture to te teach science or math or other topics, right? That's a big part of it? That's exactly right. Integrating, you know, the plants, animals, food, farmers, everything involved in, in agriculture within those academic classes so a student doesn't necessarily need to just be in an ag class to learn about agriculture. And the age ranges for the, for typically for ag in the classroom in the schools? We're proud to offer things at every level. So K through 12, there's, um, like I mentioned, some lesson plans, resources, things that would be appropriate for that age level. And we also really try to educate the teachers as well. So we offer professional development opportunities where myself and our other um, Ag in the Classroom education specialists will come do a hands-on workshop to show teachers how to utilize these tools. We're also really excited this summer we're offering three teacher tours. So for two days, we travel around to different you know, farms, processing site, research institutes, so those teachers can learn a little bit about agriculture and then also see how that fits in their curriculum. Sure. So we move from all ages to, in your case, Val, with, that, with FFA, it's, it's a different group, but it's a very different kind of experience as well. It is. So we really focus our programs on seventh grade through age 21. And it, so our curriculum is taught in the high school and junior high level. And we really try to give those students skills that will be useful to themselves, but also for them to share what they know with the greater audience. And they do that through a number of ways. Sometimes we utilize the Ag in the Classroom materials. Otherwise, it's creativity that's happening within each school. So we really know that we serve a purpose in about 185 communities across the state of Minnesota. That's to build up that individual individual as well as share what they know with others. Yeah, and sharing what they know with others, that might include things like sharing some of the information with the younger students, putting on an FFA and you know demonstration and having the younger kids involved, right? I think I've seen a lot of that. Yeah, exactly. So we've got students that go into the elementary and they mentor those students and they utilize those materials and other resources to make it hands-on learning for those younger kids, inspire them to be involved in the production of their food and, and to get a better understanding. So we know that our students, you know, nearly 11,000 of them have chosen to be in the FFA, are really involved in helping share that message. Sure, and while I know that Ag in the Classroom Minnesota has been around for about 30 years, mid-80s. The FFA goes back much longer than that. 1929 here in Minnesota. So we were one of the early states to um, bring in the Future Farmers of America. We now go by the FFA to just recognize the diversity of students coming in, as well as the diversity of opportunities that they have when they complete their FFA involvement. And I love something that you said before we started recording, and I'd like to go back to it, about the percentage of success that you see among FFA students. So we're really excited. We know that when students get involved in agricultural education, that they graduate at about 10 percent higher than the state average and they do that because it's hands-on learning. I think all of us can identify how much more we remember when we're actually physically doing it versus just verbally or hearing it. So uh, we know that the agriculture in the classroom, uh, the instruction, the FFA component and their supervised ag experience program all come together to develop a well-rounded student that's going to be successful and we first see that at a much higher graduation rate. 
And then also that may be a graduation rate that people might think of as being heavily involved in rural areas, which is true, but I know there are also urban and suburban programs really across the country, not just in Minnesota. Exactly. So our membership is about one-third rural kids that grow up on a farm. That would be re reflective of how I grew up. Another third is like my children. We live in a smaller community, but they're not on a farm. And then the last third are, are kids that are from bigger communities. We have um, programs in the Twin Cities, Rochester, Duluth, some of those larger towns as well. And the goal is FFA and ag education fits everybody. It's just finding that niche that, that intrigues them. And I'm sure, Sue, in your case, you're seeing that where you're not just talking about urban, suburban, rural kids, but wherever kids are, as Val said, they may not grow up on a farm, so the exposure and what they have to learn over the years in ag in the classroom has had to change to evolve with that. Right, and you know, no matter where those kids are, in what community or urban, suburban, rural, you know, there's always opportunity for growth in their knowledge of agriculture. So we, you know, think that that if you're in a rural community where maybe you see those cornfields but you're not really sure what's going on, you know, agriculture can be a link to help you get that. And maybe if you are one of the students that, that work on that farm, you can be like, all right, I'm doing science every day. I just didn't realize it. So, I, you know, like Val said, FFA has a place for all students. We think Ag in the Classroom has, an, has a place to be used in all communities and with all students as well. And it seems as if so many discussions about education will often focus on, you know, how is it paid for, where is it placed, where are it in the schools. And one of the interesting things about Ag in the Classroom is I know that it started with an idea of a public-private partnership. And it continues that way. So we're lucky here in, you know, in Minnesota, we have a really strong support of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So myself and one other staff person is, is funded and housed um, and there, which is fantastic because we get to have you know, experts on all sorts of agriculture topics at our fingertips. Um, but then we also have a Minnesota Agriculture in the Classroom Foundation that, um, that gets supporters and financial contributions so that we can um, develop the resources that teachers use and offer them at no cost. And I like to tell people, you know, I was a classroom agriculture teacher for 10 years and I think my two biggest challenges were having enough time and having enough money. So we try to overcome those by having free resources that we think are really well developed and can really you know just be used right away. So hopefully helping teachers overcome those challenges pretty easily. And, and as compared to that Val, I suppose for FFA the normal path for students to become engaged is through a high school that has a vocational ag teacher or multiple teachers assigned to this subject area. That is correct. So to access the FFA, you do need to have an agricultural education program in place. And so that also identifies one of the challenges we have, and that is we have a shortage of agriculture teachers. So we continue to try to recruit and retain the very best. And we know that they're the very best because business and industry wants them too. Um, but when they do choose to come into the classroom, they are impacting hundreds of students every year. And we know that's really important. And so we also work to make sure that it's affordable to people to be involved in ag education and the FFA. We know that of the FFA, 40% of them come from economically challenged homes. And so we work hard, and again, with my role with the foundation, to provide those resources so they can participate and experience those same things. And people who might not know the FFA, I suppose they will think of it as being heavily, in, which, it, which it has to be, and of course, in plant sciences, animal sciences, those things. But there's also matters such as uh, you know, mechanics, electronics, um, another good example, I was thinking the one the other day, was well, the parliamentary, the parliamentary okay. procedure folks, the speakers, so there are a lot of other elements to what they can learn in FFA. You're right on. I, I think what's neat about it is when a person comes into the FFA, there's so many opportunities, those technical areas that you talked about, but also those soft skills. And I almost hate to call them soft skills because I don't want it to undermine it, but the reality is being able to work well with people is a real skill, and they develop that in the FFA through their committee work, through their role as an officer. They're able to speak because they've been asked to recite things like the FFA creed, and then, of course, parliamentary procedure helps every meeting go better and so we know that they're better when they've come through the program. Well, I remember meeting a corporate vice president um, and I, he looked very familiar to me and he was in the, he was in the uh, uh, energy industry mm -hmm. and I thought oh I remember seeing him 30 years ago interviewing him as an FFA speaker. Sure. So yeah you talk about well, they're not really soft skills they're skills that people continue to progress and learn the rest of their lives. We're always excited to see where someone goes after they've been involved in the FFA and youth type organizations because I think they develop confidence that the average population doesn't have. They're paired with mentors who really care about them. Our advisors who are our agricultural educators are key in that development. They see potential, they challenge them in a positive way and nurture that and that's something pretty exciting to see happen. And then annually state or national competitions for them yes. which gets to be very 
A lot of people don't see it, but that's a really exciting part for the kids. I've known kids in that. So. Yeah, there, there's a lot of opportunities to set goals, achieve them, and if you don't achieve it, that's okay. You've still developed some skills, and you'll probably come back a little bit more intense next year. Yeah. Um, in the few minutes that we have left, I've le I have left, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the ways that people who are not familiar with these programs can engage with them. So in your case, Sue, Ag in the Classroom, Minnesota Department of Ag, is that where most people find you and start to, start to work with you? Potentially. I mean, there's lots of different um, ways. We try to get out and about and be present at agricultural conferences and events and also educational um, events where we can connect with those teachers. You know, we have a website, mn.agclassroom.org, that you can go to and find, you know, the different programs that we have to offer, like the tours I mentioned and grant opportunities and, and different things that are going on, as well as, you know, all of the resources that teachers can order. So, um, and also, too, it's, it's fun to um, connect with, with, like, the people in Granite Falls who are want, interested in organizing some sort of agricultural event in their community. Community. So, you know, we're willing to reach out and help organize those or give ideas for different activities and, and how you can really engage with students. So it can be anything as simple as just a few lesson plans or perhaps because of community initiative it grows into something much bigger. Right. There's lot, you know, any, anything and everything is open. We just want every student um, to have some sort of information and background about agriculture. Okay, great. And Val, the FFA, I know you'd mentioned that it, it often, the involvement often comes through a, a, a high school department where they've got teachers, but how else do people find out more about FFA and, and where they need to go? Sure, so uh, you could definitely learn more about the FFA and the FFA Foundation on our website. And I think really there's a lot of opportunities for people to get engaged and to volunteer. That might be through the FFA alumni program that we have. Those are very active volunteers. And then if it's getting involved in sponsoring students, it's through programs like our Blue Jackets Bright Futures program, where people individually sponsor a jacket to empower them to do all they can do within the FFA. FFA or, or support us in some other financial ways. So, that they, so by sponsoring a jacket, then essentially what they're doing is figuring out a way to directly help a young person. As you said, many of them are disadvantaged. Correct. There's a, almost a half of our students have some kind of economic challenges that they're dealing with. And we believe that the jacket is one way to get them fully engaged and to feel ownership in something bigger than themselves. And FFA does that for them. So well, it's exciting. And, and of course, people, you know, the, the blue FFA jackets, that's one of the things that haven't changed for a long time. So people know exactly you know, what it looks like and what they're supporting. So, great note there to end on. Val Arsvold from the FFA Foundation and Sue Knott from Ag in the Classroom. Thank you for joining us on Compass. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all for this week on the topic of Ag in the Classroom. Our Compass producer, Laura K. Prosser, will take it from here and end this week's episode with the next installment of the Compass Literature Corner. Thanks for watching. segment to the show called The Compass Literature Corner, we will be talking to local authors and writers who have had an impact on this region or whom this region has had an impact on. Today we have a man who is deeply immersed in the sci-fi and fantasy and is no schlep with 12 books under his belt, including his latest, Wolf of the Tesseract. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to say that today's guest is Redwood Falls resident Christopher D. Schmidt. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Laura. So, Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about your book, The Wolf of the Tesseract? Sure. Um, so, I often describe it as kind of a female Percy Jackson-like character and her werewolf protector companion uh, fighting against a Cthulhu-like monster that wants to destroy all of the Earth. Um, and uh, the, um, the character name is Claire, and she's actually from Duluth, where I spent uh, many years um, in in work and just I was actually over on the across the border uh, in the Wisconsin side where they tried to make me a Packers fan unsuccessfully. <laughs> That's always a trouble. <laughs> so it's set in Duluth and they say you know write what you know but you write not only what you know a little bit with Duluth but then you expanded it into dimensions and different realities. So tell us what challenges you faced with that in this book. Um, you know, I, I didn't really have a lot of challenges. Uh, I have a, a, an overly active imagination, and um, you know, I grew up watching a lot of cartoons in the 80s, which was great. And so they, they leave kind of this earth realm, and they wind up hopping. Uh, and uh, like the word tesseract is, a tesseract is actually a geometric configuration. It's a, it's a cube within a cube that's connected at the vertexes. And Tesseract is very popular because it's in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, um, and I, I love comic books, and I love the whole uh, kind of the whole that whole genre. Um, but it's not the Marvel Tesseract; it's more like Madeline Alengo's A Wrinkle in Time Tesseract. 
So I, I, I read that book as a kid and really loved it. Saw a lot of similarities with things talking about different dimensions and string theory. And of course, since I grew up in the 80s, you know, watching, watching great cartoons like He-Man and Masters of the Universe and Thundercats and a lot of these great things where, where you've got magic and then you've got advanced sci-fi and they're really just two sides of one coin. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and science and magic combined. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's really kind of neat. So the world that I write about in all these different dimensions, the main one where they're they're trying to get to the the prime, um, it's really more of like Eternia on Masters of the Universe, where you might have a guy using some kind of magic thing over here, but also using a high tech blaster <laughs> over here. Uh, and holding off a whole horde of bad guys in order to save the day. Case in point, the main uh, the guardian's father gives yes. up himself, but it's a mixture of fighting with his own magic skills and mm -hmm. setting his blazer to self-destruct. Yes, yeah, which is, of course, is a very important plot line. It kind of comes up a couple of times. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and really it's not a whole lot different than what we see in movies. Like uh, Star Wars is, Star Wars is less sci-fi and more, you know, more magic samurai in space. Well, what inspired you to write a sci-fi like this book? Yeah, just really got in and had things that, that encouraged me and kind of kept hooking me and bringing me along the way. You know, things from uh, a lot of the cartoons in the 90s, um, you know, as well as uh, a lot of the books and comic books and things that I was reading. And it, it has become more mainstream and just continues to get more so with uh, shows like The Big Bang Theory where nerd is chic. Yeah, that's very true. And this isn't your first adventure into sci-fi fantasy, correct? Yeah. You have how many other series out there already? Uh, I have a fantasy series uh, called The Caicos Realm, which is a seven book arc. The third book is coming soon. Uh, I have a uh, I have kind of a duology. It's a, it's a shorter e-book that accompanies um, the main book, uh, which is um, The Last Watchman, which is very kind of, very Joss Whedon-esque, uh, very mm -hmm. Firefly, where it's kind of Kind of steampunk in space and a little timey wimey, um, but uh, it's not tr it's not a not a true western in space like mm -hmm. Firefly was, but it has those feels because there's some tropes there. You get the strong cast of characters, and they're just trying. It's them against the world, and they're just trying to keep gas in the ship. Well, were you ever concerned about translating your ideas to paper when it came to sci-fi, different dimensions, realities, a lasers, little? blasters, and magic? <laughs> Only a little, um, because I grew up watching these things in cartoons. And I had a teacher, he was an art teacher, um, talking about drawing. And he would always tell, tell his students, myself included, um, just draw it like you see it. Uh, so when I've got an idea in my mind, it's really just a matter of communicating what, what I want the, the readers to envision. And uh, uh, I had a lot of conversations. I had a, a German foreign exchange student uh, that we were really discussing this when the book was still in, in writing in its first draft. And uh, we were talking about a lot of advanced science and things like the string theory and whatnot, alternate dimensions, and how would this look and how would that. And so she, would, she was very talkative and always asking a, way too many questions. But that made me think of the answers to those. So it really made me flesh out the ideas. And then it was just a matter of, communicating them in the best way and so many many drafts uh, getting readers feedback so you know if, if there's any confusion on something let me go back and rewrite it until that confusion is gone and now you're working on comics and a sequel to it mm -hmm. and people can find your books at selected barnes and noble amazon and where else they can find it on my website uh, which is www.authorchristopherdschmitz.com. Uh, that's with a Z, but if you, if you just Google around for a while, you'll eventually find it. Wonderful. And what's next, what's next for The Wolf of Tesseract? Uh, well, you mentioned the comic book. I have a prequel that's coming out, which really helps to summarize the, all the backstory, the history uh, of this universe that I've created. And I'm working currently on, uh, on book two, um, so it will, all the future versions of this will hopefully have the tagline Wolves of the Tesseract, book one and then book two, uh, which is called Through the Dark Gates of Koth, and uh, where it gets a little more H.P. Lovecraft and the characters have grown up and they've grown in the relationships a little more and a lot of the side characters begin to kind of come into their own more and the world just gets bigger and eventually the book will end with it being a trilogy.
Perfect. Thank you so much, Christopher. Thank you for having me. That's it for us in the Literature Corner. Please tune in next week for more people, places, and issues facing our viewing area. I'm Pioneer's Laura K. Prosser, and may your compass always point you in the direction of a good book. Major support for Compass is provided by the ongoing support of the Leo P. Flynn Estate of Millbank, South Dakota. Additional support is provided by the Southwest Minnesota Private Industry Council, promoting Southwest Minnesota as a place rich with opportunity. Come for the jobs, stay for the lifestyle. More information at swmnpic.org.